Good evening. When Israeli planes bombed the Iraqi nuclear reactor in Baghdad in July, that raid became one of only a few things we in the West know about Iraq. The only other time it had touched our consciousness was when it went to war with its neighbor, Iran. It was a war that was to be over in a hurry, but now, a year later, it continues in an apparent stalemate. But what of Iraq's centuries-old internal problems, the profound disagreements with its Kurdish population and between its two Muslim groups, the Sunni minority and the Shia majority? And most importantly, what about Iraq's 44-year-old leader, President Saddam Hussein? There is much to learn about him and his plans for his Middle East Arab nation of 13 million people. The Israeli reactor raid has made that learning seem even more urgent because Iraq remains determined to be the first Arab country with a nuclear capability. It has oil reserves that could turn out to be as large as any in the world, and it wants very much to achieve a dominant role in the Middle East. A few weeks ago, a reporting team from the BBC program Panorama went to Iraq, met with President Hussein, and filmed a report, part of which we're going to show you tonight. The correspondent is Richard Lindley. Looming over Liberation Square, in every shop window, office and workshop, is a portrait of the President. Saddam Hussein is everywhere. The tributes don't stop this side idolatry. He is the perfume of Iraq, the eagle whose grandeur dazzles the heavens. Since there was an Iraq, you were its awaited and promised one. Saddam Hussein wants to make the once romantic city of Baghdad again the center, the powerhouse of Arab ambition. <laughs> Saddam goes the song, you are a welcome guest in every Iraqi house. Much of Saddam's Iraq looks like this, and it sometimes seems that the president is determined to visit every one of its dusty acres, bringing gifts to transform these neglected peasant farmers into loyal subjects. Saddam works tirelessly away to make himself at one with the people. Saddam promises this village a school and electricity. And because all this is broadcast on national television, the president's bounty can be seen and admired throughout the land. In whatever sense you take it, Saddam Hussein is indeed Iraq's big brother. Virtually unknown in the West, this was his first television interview, Saddam Hussein with his crinkly smile is an ever-present image to every Iraqi. Even as we asked him why he permitted such an extravagant personality cult, his own personal cameraman recorded the interview. That wasn't my choice. I did not wish to be. Nor is it of my making or my doing. It is a natural state that has f flowed inside the Iraqi behavior, the Iraqi self. Even that, I tried to resist it. But this is something that when it comes from uh, the people, and in a spontaneous, natural way, then we should not be afraid of it. This is how Saddam Hussein set about trying to obtain that responsible position of leadership that he now enjoys. This is the authorized film version, regularly shown on television, of the youthful Saddam's attempt with his friends to assassinate the then president of Iraq. A career begun in violence has continued in the same way. In power, Saddam has one of the worst records in the Middle East for killing political opponents. <laughs> Under Saddam Hussein, those ancient heroes are now being given the big screen treatment. 13 centuries ago, the Arabs proved that they could unite and win. In the three-day battle of Qadassiyah, they attacked and defeated their traditional enemies, the Persians, from what is now Iran. The Iraqis draw the parallel between their victory then 
and the battle they are fighting now. But Saddam Hussein's war against Iran, the Qadassiyah War as he calls it, has now lasted not three days, but ten long months. The Islamic feast of Aid al-Adha saw Iraqi infantrymen battling their way through the streets of Muhammara. President Saddam Hussein sent his soldiers greetings on this occasion and told of his pride in their achievement, one worthy of their famous ancestors. Pride and impatience too. Not until a month after the beginning of the war did Saddam's troops gain control of the strategically important town of Muhammara, or Khorram Shah, as the Iranians call it. They had to take it street by street, hand to hand. Their courage was matched by the fanatic bravery of Khomeini guards on the Iranian side. Iraqi losses were simply too high. In the area of Zabil Zehab, in territory captured from Iran, Panorama was taken to the scene of what was supposed to have been some of the hottest recent fighting of the war, the so-called Spring Offensive. The Iraqis claimed 4,700 enemy killed in this sector of the battle. We never did see the six villages the Iraqis claimed to have captured in the valley below. If the armies had fought, they now seem to have retired again to their hilltop vantage points. This observation post had been here in the same place since the very first week of the war. But officially, the war marches from victory to victory, all shown on TV in Scenes from the Battle. Iraq claims to have destroyed 1,300 tanks, 200 more than Iran had to begin with. As for the bodies, if thousands were killed, it's surprising that the film lingers so long on three corpses. And although it's an hour long, the film never shows a single captured Iranian. It begins to look as if the Qadassiyah war has slowed to what one military commander has called a stationary offensive. Spectacular military activity on the ground and in the air can be misleading. Are the targets occupied or abandoned? How far away is the enemy? We asked Major Bob Elliott for an expert analysis. Now, what do you make of this? An MIA firing. He's shot. He's... I'm timing it. It's a long, long flight. It's still flying. It's fairly uneven. He's all over the place with the thing. It's a, a wire-guided thing. He's probably having difficulty with it. It's still flying. Bouncing across the terrain. Still moving. On and on and on. This is just impossible. Impossible in what way? It's far too far for uh, any re any reasonable shot. There he goes. He's finally hit it. That was over 30 seconds, which is at 300 odd miles an hour. Oh, 30 seconds. About about three to three and a half miles, which is well out of the range of most engagements of that type of weapon. What do you make of what's going on in this film anyway? He's got um, a lot of people moving around. They're obviously not being shot at. They're moving along quite happily out in the open. The dust um, behind their vehicles is um, quite noticeable and would be noticeable for quite some distance. Uh, nothing in this series of shots would indicate there was any real action taking place on this front at this time. War is scarcely new here. This eastern frontier of the Arab world has been fought over not for hundreds but for thousands of years. Since 1520, 16 successive treaties have tried to define the common border between Arabs and the Persians of Iran. Only by going to war, they say, could the Iraqis make the Iranians abandon their illegal occupation of this Arab land. These little patches of ground have small importance except to national pride. But in the far south, where the border runs becomes a vital strategic matter for Iraq. In contrast to the hundreds of miles of Iran sea coast, the Shuttle Arab estuary is Iraq's only outlet to the sea. The 1975 treaty drew the border down the middle of the channel. Now, on the grounds that Iran has already broken the treaty, Iraq is determined to regain control over all the Shuttle Arab. Saddam Hussein says that he hasn't taken more Iranian territory because he doesn't want it. But unless he does advance to gain control of more key points like Abadan, he has little chance of making the Iranians 
come to terms. How are you going to persuade the Iranians either to accept defeat or to come to some agreement with you? As to when the other side will be convinced by all this, it seems to us that it needs a great deal of time, amount of time. He does have a problem. Uh, you must remember that Saddam Hussein has himself uh, rested a lot of his own prestige on the prestige of the army. He has said that the Iraqi army is going to be the defender of the Arab nation against its enemies, the enemies being the Iranians and the Israelis. Well, uh, as apart from the uh, victory in Khurram Shah and Muhammad in uh, October, November uh, of last year, the Iraqi army hasn't scored any famous victories since then. And now uh, the Iraqi skies are defenseless against an Israeli penetration 500 miles away. So that in a sense, this must dent his, uh, his own uh, prestige. I think he's popular enough to withstand these particular reverses, but it seems to me very important that the war itself with Iran must be resolved sooner rather than later. He cannot go on for the next two to three to four years fighting this kind of war, uh, with the war affecting the economic performance of, of Iraq and by, and by uh, consequence the social policies upon which he has built his popularity. If you can't give the people the victory as you promised, then you must give them plenty of bread. And that is exactly what Saddam Hussein has been doing. 17,000 pounds to every war widow together with a plot of land, and more goods in the shops than when the war started. The Arab Ba'ath, or Renewal Party, that Saddam leads in Iraq calls itself socialist. Though the private sector is allowed a small role, the government decides what reaches the shops. Today, you can buy foreign imports like electrical goods, though more and more modern essentials are made in Iraq. Baghdad and the rest of Iraq is full of holes. Roads are being built and rebuilt. Soon they'll start tunneling for an underground metro system, the first anywhere in the Middle East, including Israel. Under this year's development plan, Iraq will try to spend 10,000 million pounds, a figure that's determined more by what the oil exports bring in than what the country can effectively spend. With not enough skilled workers and an inadequate transport system, progress always threatens to become paralysis. Saddam's Iraq needs development. But what effect is it having on Iraqis who suddenly find their whole way of life disturbed? <laughs> Trying to do too much too quickly means economic indigestion with painful human consequences. If Iraqis find their lives disrupted and the old ways demolished before something new is ready to take their place, then Saddam Hussein will be building on sand just like the late Shah of Iran. To try and avoid his fate, Saddam is meeting social needs, like cheap housing. There are 11,000 flats in this one development alone. I think in Iraq we have learned our lesson of development early in the game. Unless economic uh, development is coupled with social uh, development, it will perhaps create the conditions that will explode society from within. And this is perhaps what happened in Iran. As far as we are concerned in Iraq, we are uh, very watchful of this critical balance between economic and social development. And this is the reason why we give social development uh, a very high priority in our program. <laughs> Unity, liberty and socialism is the slogan of the Arab Ba'ath Party. And in a country which is deeply, perhaps even fatally divided, unity is the first priority, by a very long way. Children may be moulded. The Kurds are an older and more intractable problem. At home in the mountainous north, the Kurds have always threatened to destroy the precarious unity that is modern Iraq. They fought bitterly to extract from Baghdad an autonomy close to independence. In 1975, the situation was so serious that Saddam was forced to conclude a humiliating agreement with Iran, in return for which the Shah ceased to support the Kurds. Only then were they compelled to stop fighting and hand in their weapons. Again, promising real autonomy 
Saddam brought the Kurds down from the mountains with a blend of brutality and benevolence. Though it's still run directly from Baghdad, this cloth factory is the showpiece of the autonomous region. Using money to solve a political problem, it pays out £115,000 in wages every month to domesticate its new Kurdish workers. Many Kurds still reject the idea that they're all Iraqis now. As a result of their resistance, 27 Kurds were last month reportedly sentenced to death. What happens to Saddam Hussein's political opponents, Kurds and others? Most victims are too frightened to talk afterwards about their experiences. Rafiq Bashdari was the only man we found ready to tell his story openly. A story of torture. In Rome, there was something like spring, spring, when you're going to make a building to send... Hoisted into the air at the end of a rope, Rafiq had his legs beaten with rubber truncheons. He made me like that to, to back, and because it was the spring, he made me, I'm going to up. I wanted to up, to up, about more than uh, four, four meter. My leg, it is like, like that, it is going, I am to, to up here. I'm going to uh, beat me. I think it was taken more than two days. After two days, they come to beat my hand, arm, my arm. And the third day, if my arm is not broken, to see here, my arm was broken. And after three days... Eventually, Rafiq says, they gave up beating him. His limbs were so swollen that the blows no longer seemed to be making any impression on them at all. Leg, it is like, like here. They put it here as something. When they cut, they put, he make me like like uh, that, like uh, electric, like make me like that the, all my body and all my ha head is going uh, uh, up. Uh, uh, uh. Finally, and after six days of torture, which left him unable to do anything other than speak, Rafiq heard a voice warn him that if he didn't talk, he would certainly soon be dead. I said, I have nothing, only just, I have one thing, Please, please, I don't want to stay like that. I am not a animal. I am a man. I am not an animal. Please kill me. Appalled by what it heard about the extent to which torture was routinely used in Iraq, Amnesty International this summer published a special report which examined 15 unrelated cases. The treatment the 15 Iraqis alleged they were subjected to range from crude physical assaults with fists, boots, truncheons and whips, to sustained beating of the soles of the feet, systematic electric shock torture, and mock executions. Torture of a sexual nature featured again and again in the allegations. There were said to have been verbal and actual physical sexual humiliations of men and women detainees. Amnesty therefore concluded that the findings of the medical examinations of 15 Iraqis confirmed that torture took place in Iraq between September 1976 and August 1979. The consistency between the torture described by the 15 former detainees cited in the report and the torture allegations received by Amnesty International since August 1979 suggests strongly that torture may be continuing and widespread in Iraq. <laughs> Many Iraqis have become victims of oppression because of the ancient religious divide that still plagues Islam. In the Arab world at large, Sunni Muslims are in the overwhelming majority. But here in Iraq, that is not the case. Here, the Sunnis are in a minority, a minority which has traditionally run the country and to which Saddam Hussein belongs. A minority which feels threatened by the much larger number of Shia Muslims, mostly in the south. The Shia problem is perennial, but for Saddam Hussein it has suddenly become very much more serious. Where does the loyalty of Iraq's Shia majority lie? With their fellow Arabs and Saddam Hussein? Or with the Shias across the border in enemy Iran? The question is acute because so many of Saddam's soldiers are Shias, 
Will they go on fighting Saddam's Qadassir war? Saddam rightly suspects that Iraq Shias in the illegal Dawah party are plotting to overthrow him and install an Islamic government on the Iranian model. It was because he felt so threatened by Iranian jives that his secular socialist state was not Muslim, that he himself was a godless heathen, that Saddam finally went to war with Khomeini. What do these people do who call themselves the Da'wah party? They take the military secrets from the Iraqi army and send them to Iran. They draw for them even the positions of the airfields. This kind of model doubtlessly is an agent, is an official agent. Therefore, we have got to cut off their necks. Saddam Hussein has never hesitated to cut off people's necks. When harsh justice is free from ulterior motives, he says, people will accept it, whatever its impact on them is. These were the regime's first victims, mostly Jews and some Shias, hanged in public for spying. More recently, the communists have been outlawed and many of them executed. Revolutionary courts, staffed not by independent judges, but military men or government officials, hand out death sentences for an increasing number of non-violent political offences. Under Article 200 of the Penal Code, it's now a capital offence to join the Ba'ath Party while concealing a previous political membership. Revolutionary Command Council No. 884 decrees that anyone who's done his military service and then engages in any other political activity other than that of the Ba'ath may be executed. We've always had executions and, 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 and torture in Iraq. So from that point of view, this present regime isn't very different. And indeed, if you compare it to the other third world countries and, and Middle Eastern countries, I don't think it is, it is very different. They're all very authoritarian and very, and very firm. Uh, you must remember, for example, between 1958 and 1968, the demise of the monarchy in 58 and the advent of the present Ba'athist regime in 68, uh, there were seven attempted coups. And I don't mean just plots, actual coups where troop movements uh, were out on the, on the street. Now, all this suggests that if you want to govern Iraq, you need to be firm if you want to survive. There is no way that you can survive if, unless you're firm. In one six-week period last year, Saddam's Iraq is said to have executed 100 political prisoners. When does firmness become tyranny? And when does harsh justice become a random reign of terror? I wish to say something. If each British citizen goes back to the same stage in the social development and cultural and political and economic in his country to what corresponds to the level that Iraq has now reached then he would have interpreted a great number of that as being seen, regarded as negative. He would give it a different outlook, a different interpretation. <laughs> the opposition in our country after the development that took place throughout 13 years period it was no longer a local opposition but an international opposition should it be subject to torture and execution yes it, 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 it calls for it to be subject to to execution and to torture. In accordance with the law, we say he who collaborates uh, with a foreign party is sentenced to death. In your country, having gone through all this phase of development, the presence of a political group that sympathizes with a foreign party it will not 
uh, draw back Britain to 200 years before. But in a country like ours, it will do that. Yeah. If Saddam is not to be weighed by Western democratic standards, then the judgment must depend on what he's done for you or to you. The prize-winning pioneer reads Saddam an ode. وتمر ذكراه العطرة التي تعانقت بشوق ولهفة مع الانتصارات الرائعة. Everyone knows what Iraq is today and who is its leader. You who have made our country a fountain of plenty. You who have made us happy. You who have made our parents smile. You, the image of the present, which comprehends all the glories of the past and all our hopes and ambitions for the future. If there are no assassinations, if there are no coups, say in about 10 years' time, when, especially when the present young generation, which is absolutely inculcated with Ba'athist value and with a devotion to Saddam Hussein, gets into positions of influence, if this can continue, then you might very well see a system which is very similar to the one that existed in Yugoslavia under Tito, where Tito's charisma reinforced and was reinforced by the organizational ability of the Communist Party. What you'll have in Iraq is Saddam Hussein reinforcing uh, and being reinforced by the organizational ability of the Ba'ath Party. And if this goes on, if this can be achieved, then you might very well see, because of the confidence of the, of the regime in its survivability, you might very well see a, a greater liberalization and greater freedoms being uh, given to the population. That's all for tonight. I'm Jim Lehrer. Thank you and good night.